Hi there, AP Euro students, and welcome to today's lecture on economic history of the 17th and 18th century. Uh, this is both sections three and four of unit three, of course, in AP Euro, and this is going to be a fascinating and gripping lecture. So part one is the agricultural revolution of the 17th and 18th century. We will have the same objective throughout the entire lecture. So there's three parts. All parts have the same objective, which is to explain the continuities and changes in commercial and economic developments from 1648 to 1815. There's lots of key concepts for this lecture. Um, the AP really likes to stress the social and economic history in particular. So even though it may not be your favorite topic, there is a very high likelihood of it appearing on future exams. So as long as you understand these key concepts and sort of the, some examples behind them, you should be fine. Let's take a quick look at them. First one, the agricultural revolution raised productivity and increased the supply of food and other agricultural products. Number two, the importation and transplantation of agricultural products from the Americas contributed to an increase in the food supply of Europe. And the third one, labor and trade in commodities were increasingly freed from traditional restrictions imposed by governments and corporate entities. And number four, the putting out system or cottage industry expanded as increasing numbers of laborers in homes or workshops produced for markets through merchant intermediaries or workshop owners, but it doesn't stop there. There's more. Number five, the European dominated worldwide economic network contributed to the agricultural, industrial, and consumer revolutions in Europe. Number six, the price revolution contributed to the accumulation of capital and the expansion of the market economy through the commercialization of agriculture, which benefited large landowners in Western Europe. And finally, number seven, the attempts of landlords to increase their revenues by restricting or abolishing the traditional rights of peasants could lead to revolt. So this is going to continue to build on some of the important economic themes that we learned about in unit one on the commercial revolution. So it may be a good idea to go back and review some of those notes, again, in order to understand our objective, which is changes and continuities in economic history. So the major themes we're going to be, we're going to see in this lecture, economic is obviously the big one, but also tech, uh, technological and other scientific innovation and social organization and development. So let's start out by discussing the state of agriculture at the beginning of the 18th century. <clears throat> so ever since the Middle Ages, peasants <clears throat> and artisans had about the same standard of living. Um, that has been a pretty clear continuity. Most people had battled hunger and lacked sufficient clothing and decent housing. Agriculture had changed very little since the Middle Ages. In fact, 80% of Western Europe's population were farmers. Uh, this is another pretty uh, reliable continuity until we get to the Industrial Revolution in the next century. And of course, this percentage was even higher in Eastern Europe, where we're starting to see the codification of serfdom. The only exception to this was the Netherlands. Uh, as a small, compact country, it was also more urban and mercantile. Uh, meaning it had that strong, vibrant commercial economy, uh, especially from the 17th century. <clears throat> Agricultural output was very low compared to modern standards. Uh, the most uh, farmers in Europe still used the medieval open field system, uh, which was not the most productive form of agriculture. And again, we did talk about the open field system way back in Unit 0. So that was still the, the predominant method of farming. Um, and because it did not yield, meaning it didn't produce a lot of uh, food, this made uh, farmers and peasants very susceptible to things like famine. And famine was a pretty regular occurrence because you could basically count on a failed harvest once or twice a decade, which would cause famine 
Um, and most uh, peasants did not have enough food to really put aside and store. They didn't have enough money to buy food if there was a famine. So this caused uh, sort of an element of chronic malnourishment in the population, and especially during bouts of famine, that malnourishment increased. This would make people more susceptible to disease, uh, which, you know, diseases like the plague, and this became sort of a natural check on population, which we'll explore later. And science was really just a branch of theology and had no real application in agriculture. Uh, we will start to learn about the scientific revolution <clears throat> in our next unit, uh, but it still has not become very mainstream and it's still pretty limited in its scope. It begins in astrophysics. It takes a while before it really is applied to things like agriculture and industry. Another uh, important continuity that we've seen since the Middle Ages is this idea of subsistence agriculture, which, which really, of course, was supported by the open field system. So subsistence agriculture is really farming just for the purpose of survival. Uh, the open field system only really produced enough land for people to have food for themselves. There was really no surplus. There was no extra. So this meant that peasants generally did not sell their food commercially. They only grew what they needed in that region. And most farming on common lands was done for the subsistence purposes for the village. So usually there's like the village or the manor owned by the, the lord, and everyone on the village or man, manor would farm in the common lands, which were technically owned by the lord, but he let everyone work there to uh, you know, maintain their livelihood, basically. These common lands were open, and usually everyone had a strip of, of agriculture. Uh, these lands were not divided by fences or hedges. Everything was open and accessible. And there were, there were you know, established systems uh, within each community to make sure people knew what, what, which was their strip and, um, you know, that things were done fairly and, and, and equitably and things like that. Um, open fields were farmed as a community. Like I said, everyone was involved. Agriculture in villages changed little from generation to generation. It was really based largely on community and family traditions. But one of the problems with agriculture was the exhaustion of soil. Uh, soil gets to a point where if it is not replenished um, with another product or if it uh, it doesn't have time to recover. It runs out of nutrients and it essentially becomes like dead dirt and you can't grow anything in it. And that was definitely a problem uh, with you. And, that, and that's why we have the open field system. The open field system was this idea that you rotate your fields and you let one field remain uh, kind of empty or fallow and that allowed the soil to replenish so that you could use it again the next year. But the downside of that, of course, is that it limited the amount of food that could be produced from your land. So as I was saying, basically one third to one half of lands were allowed to lie fallow on any given year so the soil could recover. Um, this becomes known as three crop field rotation in northern Europe and two crop field rotation in the Mediterranean. Like I said, this was necessary to allow the soil to recover, but the disadvantage is it um, did not allow for the maximum production of food. Villages also maintained open meadows for hay and natural pasture and also for animal grazing. Um, peasants were often taxed very heavily by their local lords. This is another thing that exacerbated the subsistence agriculture and made it really difficult for them to have any type of rainy day fund of food or money. And of course, even if we think it's bad in Western Europe, it's always going to be worse in Eastern Europe as serfdom is codified and their treatment is far worse than what we see with peasants in the West. But in the 18th century, England, the Netherlands, and France became leaders in agriculture, industry, and trade, and this would result in population growth. And this is where we start to see some important changes. So the 18th century is, uh, features this event called the Agricultural Revolution. This is actually the second agricultural revolution in human history 
and I refer to it as the smaller agricultural revolution. In AP World History, um, or maybe even in your middle school history classes, you may have learned about the big agricultural revolution, which is sometimes referred to as the Neolithic Revolution. And this is when humankind began to plant um, uh, uh, plant produce and actually start to use agriculture. So this is like, so originally way back in the BCE era, we're talking like 7,000 BCE, we have the original agricultural revolution in which the, the practice of agriculture was established. So people went from being hunter-gatherers to, agri to settled agricultural communities. So that had happened thousands of years ago. That's not what this agricultural revolution is about. This agricultural revolution, which takes place in the 18th century, um, is about new techniques and new technology applied to agriculture. So it's about new techniques and new technology applied to agriculture. And this is a necessary precursor for the Industrial Revolution. Now, the Industrial Revolution is probably one of the single biggest changes it, for all of humanity and all of human history, basically since that first big uh, agricultural revolution in the Neolithic era. So this small one is leading us into a massive change, which we'll talk about in second semester. Anyways, let's get to it. So this agricultural revolution of the 18th century resulted in increased crop and animal yields that could feed more people. And that, like I said, is going to be critical for the Industrial Revolution. This was developed through new methods of cultivation. Crops were now grown in new areas like reclaimed wastelands and uh, previously uncultivated common lands, so common lands that had not been used for farming. Also, the selective breeding of livestock would lead to better cultivation of livestock. So that's things like horses, cows, pigs, chicken, your basic farm animals. And this would result in healthier animals. And the reason for all of this is because science and technology would, have, would be applied to agriculture in the 18th century. So here we have a little image to help us understand some of the basics of crop rotation, which is going to be one of the uh, major developments. This is a new technique or a new method. So this is a change in agricultural pra practice. The old method was kind of like that open field system, that three field system where one field lay, would lay fallow. But we will see that with this new type of crop rotation, fields could continue to be used as long as the crops that were planted alternated. Um, and we'll talk more about this as we get into the lecture. But here you can see kind of a visual of that, that con this new concept of crop rotation, which is really important in the development of the agricultural revolution. So in the agricultural revolution, the low countries, that means Belgium and especially the Netherlands, led the way. So there was an increased population in the Netherlands. The Netherlands, like the proper Dutch Republic, had a fairly concentrated population. And this meant that they had to find new methods of agriculture. This was a really, this is really important for their survival and, and their ability to function. Uh, the growth of towns and cities in this region created major markets for food that was produced in the countryside. So Again, the Netherlands were more urbanized than other parts of Europe, so there was a greater demand for food in the city. So there was a need for the countryside to produce some surplus. Subsistence agriculture was no longer going to cut it. This also led to regional specialization in the Netherlands. Uh, this means that certain areas were used for farming, certain regions were used for fishing and shipping, and towns and cities were used for mercantile activities. By the mid-17th century, that's the 1600s, the Dutch enclosed fields, they rotated crops, they employed the heavy use of manure for fertilizer. Manure, in case you don't know, is animal poop, like especially from cows, and they planted a wide variety of crops. And the reason the, the Dutch were so successful at this is because they had this free and capitalistic society. So they really did not have the government controlling 
what merchants and businessmen could and could not do, and this provided profit incentives for farmers to be more productive. The Netherlands also experimented a lot with drainage. So the reason they experimented with drainage is because much of Holland, which was which is one of those outer provinces right along the the, the Atlantic, uh, this was often marshland, or it was actually covered by ocean waters. We've talked about how parts of the Netherlands are actually below sea level, and they have these sea walls called dikes to keep out the water. And so in order to utilize more of this land, the Dutch became world leaders in reclaiming wetlands through drainage. Uh, and they would teach this, these techniques through to many other Europeans. Cornelius Vermuyden was the most famous of the Dutch engineers in regards to drainage techniques, and drainage was later used extensively in southern England to create new farmlands. So let's move on to England in the Agricultural Revolution, because this is actually where the biggest and most important changes will take place. By 1870, now this is jumping ahead quite a while, but still it's important for context. By 1870, crop yields had tripled since 1700, but only a 14% increase in people working the land. So this is pretty remarkable, and we're going to explore how England does that. Basically, Viscount Charles Townshend pioneered the idea of crop rotation. So as England's ambassador to the Netherlands, he witnessed Dutch, the Dutch using nitrogen-rich crops such as turnips and clover to replenish soil so that fallowing was not necessary. Like I said, up until this point, like all throughout the Middle Ages and the early modern period, uh, the three-field rotation had called for one of the fields to be left fallow or empty so the soil could recover. But the Dutch discovered that if they planted certain crops that were rich in nitrogen, like turnips and clover, that this would replenish the soil and therefore leaving it fallow was not necessary and turnips and clover could be useful, uh, useful produce for um, feeding animals, among other things. So Townshend learned these techniques and he then also later drained much of the land back home in England. He employed crop rotation using turnips, peas, beans, clover, and potatoes to help improve crop yields. He became so well known for this that some actually nick nicknamed him Turnip Townshend. He also, this enriched soil also provided more food for the livestock, and that livestock manure could then be used in turn as fertilizer to help with the fields and the growth of the produce. Also, the increased food for livestock meant that a mass slaughter of animals was no longer needed prior to winter. So before this, it was really a common tradition for villages to slaughter most of their livestock because they wouldn't have enough food to help them survive throughout the winter. Um, and of course, that's kind of gruesome and makes the winter difficult to survive. Uh, but now, these new crops allowed more animal food to, to sustain the animals through the winter. So animal feed, like I said, now available to sustain the livestock through the winter. And people were able to eat more fresh meat rather than preserving surplus meat through salting, which would improve health and um, longevity for people. By 1740, these new agricultural techniques had become quite popular among much of the English aristocracy and we will see how that affects their economic practice on a later slide. However, I want to tell you a little bit more about some more, uh, a few more pieces of technology that are critical in the development of the early uh, agricultural revolution. Uh, for example, the seed drill by Jethro Tull. Should be remember, easy to remember Jethro Tull's name. It's like Tully, but without the Y. So his innovation of the seed drill is an example of how the empiricism, which basically means like the process, the thought process of the scientific revolution was applied to agriculture. So his invention, the seed drill, allowed for sowing crops in a straight row rather than scattering it by hand. And the horses were used for plowing rather than slower oxygen. So essentially this is a faster, 
more productive way to plant the seeds in a field as you are, are, are doing agriculture. And then Robert Bakewell pioneered techniques for the selective breeding of livestock. Uh, so this allowed larger and healthier animals to be developed. It also resulted in the increased availability of meat, wool, leather, soap, and candle tallow, all of which were uh, animal-based products, and also more manure available for fertilizing. So just to clarify what we mean by selective breeding, um, basically you're, gonna, you're going to uh, deliberately breed the animals that have the desirable characteristics that you want to continue in their offspring. So if you want the fattest pigs, then you're going to have the fattest boy pig mate with the fattest girl pig, and they will produce the fattest little piglets, basically. If you want uh, cows that produce lots of milk, you're going to make sure that the bull mates with your female cows that produce the best milk. I think you get the general idea. Now, related to this is, of course, the Columbian Exchange. We've mentioned the Columbian Exchange back in Unit 1, so we don't have to spend a lot of time uh, re, uh, reviewing it right now. But the Columbian Exchange does play a major factor in the overall agricultural revolution because this introduced important new foods from the New World. And these new foods really became increasingly available in the 17th and 18th century. They actually weren't that common in the 15th and 16th century. Uh, they were met with a bit of skepticism. Also, uh, they still were just limited. You know, they just hadn't made their way across Europe. But some of these new foods from the New World, like potatoes and corn, were really important because they were so useful. They were highly nutritious and really, really easy to grow. And these were some of the crops that would also help with the replenishing of the soil. So new, the potatoes and corn are kind of like the basics, but there's tomatoes, there's all types of other foods that are going to be introduced to the European diet to diversify the cuisine, which not only makes food taste better, but it'll also make people healthier. Now, one of the major consequences of the, of the agricultural revolution is something known as the enclosure movement. Now, the enclosure movement began in its own right as early as the 16th century. Basically, this is when landowners uh, who want to increase profits will enclose their fields to kind of be like, this field is mine and no one else can use it. And I'm doing this because I want to keep all the profit that comes from this field. So this began in the 16th century when landowners began enclosing fields for the purpose of raising sheep. Um, and this is a little bit different from 18th century enclosure, which was based, uh, based largely on agriculture. Now, as agriculture began to become more profitable in the 18th century due to these new techniques and technology that I've been discussing, uh, the enclosure of fields intensifies because the greed of the landlords will also intensify. The practice effectively ended the old medieval tradition of the open field system on common land. So again, the enclosure movement produces an important, an, another important change in agricultural process and productivity. Landowners be, uh, began to consolidate their scattered holdings into compact fields that were, fat, were fenced in. So basically, they're fencing in their fields and saying, these are my fields. No one else can have them. They did not allow you know, villagers and peasants to work the fields for their own benefit. Common pasture lands were also enclosed. Again, that limited access to, for people to raise their own animals. Um, these wealthy landowners basically enjoyed something called freehold tenure, uh, which means that they, they, since they owned these lands and had let people just use them, they could decide to kick them off whenever they wanted. Uh, the ownership and the control of lands indefinitely thus restricting the use of the village common. So because they had always owned these lands, they are like, okay, guys, you can't use it anymore. And the villagers were like, wait, you can't do that? And the landowners were like, nope, yes, we can. We've always owned this land. It's called freehold tenure. So you guys have to go somewhere else. Thanks. Bye. So this 
Enclosure movement would result in the commercialization of agriculture. This is another big change that we are witnessing in economic history. So just a hint, whenever you hear me say something's a big change, like write that in the margin or circle it or highlight it in a special color, because remember the objective of this, of this whole lecture is about continuity and change. So there's a very good chance you might be asked about that at some point to identify examples of change and continuity in economics and agriculture. Just saying. So as I was saying, the commercialization of agriculture was a big development, a big change. These large landowners prospered and invested in new technology, machinery, breeding, new cultivation methods. This increased the number of large and middle-sized farms. And Parliament, which was dominated by landowners who stood to profit from this, passed over 3,000 enclosure acts in the late 18th century and early 19th century that, of course, benefited the large landowners like themselves and their friends. Now, this next topic is getting ahead of us a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about it, honestly, more in the context of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century in early second semester um, but it is an effect of uh, some of the themes and topics we're talking about today, and that's the Corn Laws. So the, cor the Corn Laws were passed in 1815, um, and this is an example of a law passed by Parliament that benefits the landowners at the great expense of the peasantry, and it was motivated, essentially it was caused by the agricultural revolution, the enclosure technique, and the commercialization of agriculture. It was motivated by the greed of the landowners. So the idea here is that Parliament thought it would be better to force English people to buy English grain. So they put high tariffs on foreign grain to prevent foreign grain from coming into the country, or if it did, it was prohibitively expensive. Now this in turn drove up the price of English grain because there's still a demand for grain. So limited supply, high demand means the price goes up. So this greatly benefits the landlords. Now they're making a whole bunch more money because the price of grain is going up. But this hurts the poor, which is most of England, as they couldn't afford the price increases for fool, for food. So this is like one of the most Robin Hood corrupt moments in history. Like you hear about you know, Robin Hood, like steal from the rich to feed the poor. Like we don't really have, there's not, there's not that this, this law is Robin Hood, but like Robin Hood would have been all over this law because it's so corrupt and unethical. So the idea is that the Corn Laws were one of the most notorious examples of a law that benefited the wealthy at the expense of the English peasantry. So this was one of the clearest examples of the rich profiting and the poor suffering. And you can imagine, you can start to imagine how the people of England responded to the porn law, the corn laws, not the porn laws, please don't write that down, the corn laws. Um, so yes, there's not going to be good reactions to the corn laws in England. Um, well, that's another story for another day, but you can probably see where that's going to head. The, enclosures the enclosure movement had significant impact on the peasantry. Uh, many peasants were forced off lands that had once been common. Um, many moved to towns or cities looking for work since work was less available in the countryside. And this meant that many of them found work in factories or poor houses. This is a really critical step in the, industri uh, in, 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 in the development of the Industrial Revolution. Um, as peasants move to the cities, work in factories, now we're developing essentially a surplus labor force. So these peasants are not needed in agriculture because agriculture is being commercialized. We're having fewer people make more food. So now we have a surplus of labor and that labor is moving to the cities in search of work. And we'll talk more about the that particular development in the industri when we go when we get to the industrial revolution, but it's important it's still important to mention it now. Uh, many peasants unfortunately became impoverished farm laborers on large farms, basically working as wage earners. Uh, in some cases, enclosure actually freed men to pursue other uh, 
economic opportunities such as the cottage in industry. So if we want to, you know, look at the look at it as a glass half full type of thing, people could go be things other than farmers and develop skills maybe and work in the cottage industry, which we'll discuss later. But this was also very detrimental to women because women now had no way to raise animals on common land for extra money, which had been uh, a, a practice that a lot of women used to just raise a little bit of extra money. They, they often cared for the livestock and they used the common land for that livestock. But this, of course, undermined that economic opportunity for women. So let's talk a little bit more about the impact of all these various developments on women, the agricultural revolution, the commercialization of agriculture, the enclosure movement. How did all of this affect women? And we're really only talking about peasant women. Um, so in traditional communities, women had been an indispensable part of a household's economic survival. Throughout the Middle Ages and early modern period, women farmed, they raised animals, they oversaw important functions of the household. So you could mark that down as an important continuity. But the enclosure of common lands meant that women and men were forced off the land. Thus, the economic opportunities for women decreased significantly. It became much more difficult for them to find ways to supplement uh, the family's income. And so many families with daughters were eager, eager to get rid of them and get them out of the house as they were considered an extra mouth to feed. So young women, who were frankly probably about your age, uh, increasingly went to towns or cities where they became domestic workers, so like servants in houses, uh, or in many cases, when there were no alternatives, they might be prostitutes. Families who were able to get by in the countryside, meaning they were able, they didn't have to move to the cities, often supplemented their income through the cottage industry or the putting out system, uh, which was used mostly for spinning and weaving. And like I said, we'll, we'll explain that system later. But this did prove to be an effective way for women to earn a little bit of extra income. Uh, women played a very important role in spinning and weaving. Also, as a result of the agricultural revolution and enclosure movement, a strict hierarchical system emerged, and we're talking a social system here. So a few landowners, meaning the nobles and the gentry, dominated the economy and politics. So all of Parliament, both the House of Lords and the House of Commons, were dominated by these landowners. Strong and prosperous tenant farmers uh, rented land from these large landowners, and some small peasant farmers owned their own land. But a huge number of peasants, the vast majority of the English population, became wage earners on farms or in the cottage industry or gradually factory workers in the cities. Although that trend does really not take off until the 19th century. So please keep that in mind that as long as we're talking about the 17th and 18th centuries, there really is minimal migration to the factories. There were struggles between landlords and peasants as a result of this hierarchical system and this obvious um, economic inequality. Game laws were passed on the behalf of landowners, whereby any animals on an owner's vast lands could not be hunted for food. So landowners basically did not want average people like peasants hunting for uh, food on land that they did not own. So peasants who were without food would risk severe punishment if they were caught hunting for food on an owner's land. And this even involves, you know, things like pheasants and other types of birds. It doesn't even involve big things like deer. Um, so you can see that the landlords are making it really difficult for peasants with these enclosure laws and the game laws and things like that. So it was, and the corn laws, of course, you know, those as well. So not surprisingly, revolts sometimes broke out in response to these increasingly oppressive conditions for landless peasants. We'll explore more specific examples of that as we get into the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century. But you can see how the economic inequality is already established in the 18th century. Now, there's some historical debate on the impact of the enclosure movement. 
Uh, the traditional view of, of the enclosure movement was that enclosures pushed thousands of peasants out of the countryside or resulted in abject poverty for those who remained. Now, this traditional view of the enclosure movement was put forth by the socialist Karl Marx in the 19th century. Uh, we'll learn about Karl Marx uh, extensively in second semester, but basically he believes that all of history is defined by class warfare. Basically, the bourgeoisie, so those with who control the means of productions against uh, a group called the proletariat, which is like everyone else, those who do not have the means of production. At this point, we can think of them as the peasants. So, But that's how Karl Marx interpret every moment of history. Now, the more recent research suggests that maybe these negative effects of enclosure are exaggerated. Many thousands of peasants remained in the countryside working as prosperous tenant farmers, small landowners, or wage earners. And frankly, the enclosure movement may not have been that disruptive because as much as 50% of England's farmland was already enclosed by 1750. In 1700, there was a ration of two landless laborers, so people who didn't own land, for every self-sufficient farmer. And frankly, that number was not significantly larger by 1750. So the more recent research suggests that this was not that big of a dramatic change. And in the late 18th and early, and in the late 17th and early 18th century, lands were enclosed by mutual agreement between all classes of landowners in the villages. So it was maybe not as contentious and, uh, and disputed as we might suspect. Now, enclosure did not spread significantly beyond England. Uh, France did not develop enclosure as a national policy. And really, after the 1760s, peasants in the provinces strongly opposed enclosure. Uh, we'll see also France has got some other serious issues that it's dealing with in the late 18th century that may have affected the success, the success of a potential enclosure movement. But that's definitely another story for another day. And Eastern Europe did not see any fundamental changes in agriculture until the 19th century. Eastern Europe remains a strong continuity in that idea of sort of just me traditional medieval serfdom and, and all these agricultural techniques and technology that we see developed in the West are really slow to be implemented in Eastern Europe. So this last slide here is really important. Um, really, if you're not paying attention to anything in this lecture, please make sure that you are able to discuss the major impacts of the agricultural revolution. So it led ultimately to Europe's population explosion in the 18th century, which we'll talk about uh, later in this lecture. The enclosure movement also altered society in the countryside. Uh, common lands were enclosed, which changed traditional village life. It caused widespread migration to cities, which resulted in urbanization, and that would lead to the Industrial Revolution, and women overall were adversely affected. The cottage industry emerged as a means of supplementing a farm family's income. We'll talk more about that later in this lecture. And economically, the increased supply of food resulted in lower food prices that enabled people to spend more money on consumer goods, and that will also contribute to the rise of of the Industrial Revolution and manufacturing of consumer products. So that brings us to part two of our lecture, which is population explosion and proto-industrialization. We have the same objective, which is to explain the continuities and changes in commercial and economic developments from 1648 to 1815. Many key concepts, uh, starting with the first one. From the late 16th century forward, Europeans responded to economic and environmental challenges, such as the Little Ice Age, by delayed marriage and childbearing. This European marriage pattern restrained population growth and ultimately improved the economic condition of families. Number two, in the 17th century, small land holdings, low productivity agricultural practices, poor transportation,
and adverse weather limited and disrupted the food supply, causing periodic famines. By the 18th century, the balance between population and the food supplies stabilized, resulting in steady population growth. Number three, by the middle of the 18th century, higher agricultural productivity improved transportation and increased the food supply, allowing populations to grow and reducing the number of demographic crises. This was a process known as the agricultural revolution. Number four, in the 18th century, plague disappeared as a major epidemic disease. Yay, everyone likes to see plague go away. And inoculation reduced smallpox mortality. We're actually not really going to discuss that second part of that objective until a later lecture. And the putting out system or cottage industry expanded as increasing number of laborers in homes or workshops produced from markets through merchant intermediaries or workshop owners. And the major themes for this lecture are economic, technological, and social. So before 1700, there were some natural limits on population growth. Specifically, famine, disease, and warfare kept population growth in check. Uh, this cycle prevented uh, population explosion and kind of always preserved a land-labor balance. The Little Ice Age of the late 16th and early 17th centuries also imposed limits on agricultural production, and this is one of the things that contributed to famine and some of the, the general struggles during that period. It was not until, and, and, and even so, it was not until the mid-16th century that Europe's population had recovered from the Black Death of the mid 14th century. So it took Europe about 200 years to recover from the Black Death. And even then, once it recovers, it does not really expand much beyond that in the 17th century. Now, after 1700, so as we get to the 18th century, there's going to be significant population growth. And so this slide is about the causes of that population growth. Basically, it's the, it's the old principle of more food equals more babies. So the agricultural revolution made more food available to larger populations. New foods such as the potato became a staple crop for the poor in many countries, such as Ireland. Um, improved food transportation was due to better roads and canals. Better diets resulted in stronger immune systems and people to fight disease. The disappearance of the bubonic plague occurred after the 1660s. Improved sanitation developed in towns and cities. 18th century wars were less destructive on civilian populations. Actually, the 18th century does not have that many dramatic wars, like if we compare it to, say, the Thirty Years' War or the Napoleonic Wars or the, uh, or the World Wars even. But it's important to note that advances in medicine were not yet a significant cause. Uh, we're still not close to any real developments in Western medicine. So population growth had reached a plateau between about 1650 and 1750, but then it began to go, grow pretty dramatically after 1750, as you can see on this graph on the left-hand side of the screen. And between 1700 and 1800, so throughout the 18th century, the European population increased from about 120 million to about 190 million people. And you will see it's more dramatic in some regions than others, like Ireland, England, Italy, France, and holy moly Russia have significantly more increase in the population than some of these other countries. And that's largely due to either new agricultural techniques or um, new food like the potato and things like that. Like if you're wondering what that spike is in Russia, what caused that spike, it's the potato. So also an important development is this idea of proto-industrialization. So proto means like sort of, like it's the beginning of this trend of industrialization. So rural industry became a major pillar of Europe's growing economy in the 18th century. The rural population was eager to supplement its income, especially in times uh, when it was not busy in agriculture, 
Agriculture in general is a lifestyle where you're either working 24-7 or not at all. So when it's like planting and the harvest, you are out there busting your butt from dawn until dusk to do as much work as possible. But then there are long stretches throughout the year where you're really not doing much of anything. And that's a great opportunity to supplement your income as a peasant. And this is where the cottage industry really developed. So merchant capitalists in cities were eager to draw on the cheap labor in the countryside rather than paying guild members in the town's higher fees. Remember, guilds were kind of like the union of uh, slash fraternity of 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 a, of a, of a um, trade in a town, and so they you know took care of their their members and and they made sure that their members would always be paid a fair wage and things like that. Well, these merchant capitalists didn't want to have to pay them that much, so that's why they went to find unskilled cheap labor in the countryside. So this early industrial production was put out into the countryside, hence the term putting out system. But I generally refer to it as the cottage industry. So this involved manufacturing with hand tools in peasant cottages, and it came to challenge the urban craft industry. It became to challenge guilds and their dominance on the, of, on the craft industry in towns and cities. And so this will contribute to the decline of guilds as a European institution. So let's explore the cottage industry. In the cottage industry, merchant capitalists would provide raw materials, usually like raw wool, to a rural family who produced a finished or semi-finished product and sent it back to the merchant for payment. So cottage workers were usually paid by the number of pieces they produced. Uh, merchants would then sell the finished product for a profit. And wool cloth was the most important product. So basically, merchant capitalists would hire people to work out of their home. And this uh, family, this rural farming family, would work on a certain part of the production process. So maybe they were responsible for turning the raw wool into thread, or they, they used a loom to turn thread into cloth, or they, they were responsible for dyeing the cloth. And it was almost like a, an assembly line system, but between different houses. And the merchant capitalists sort of managed all of it. And of course, he was the one that profited the most. So this also meant that the cottage industry was essentially a family enterprise. Uh, the work of four to five spinners, so spinners are the people who turn the raw wool into fine thread, were needed to keep one weaver steadily employed. And the weaver would take that thread and using a loom would thread it together to create a piece of fabric. Um, hus the husband and wife constantly tried to find more thread and more spinners. Um, and oftentimes women would work as these spinners. And that's where we get the term spinsters. Uh, spinsters were widows and unmarried women who spun for their living. And so sometimes you might hear the term spinster to describe like an unmarried woman, woman or a widow woman to be like, oh, she's such a spinster. Like she's like so chronically and unattractively single in some ways. It's usually not a flattering term to call a woman a spinster because some women just want to be on their own. They just want to be independent. And that is okay. There is nothing wrong with that. Anyways, sometimes families subcontracted their work to others, meaning they would, even though they were hired by the merchant capitalists, the family would hire other people to help them work as well. Now, of course, there were some significant problems with the cottage industry. There were constant disputes between cottage, cottagers and the merchants uh, over the weights of materials or the quality of the cloth. Rural labor was also unorganized and unusual and usually difficult for the merchants to control. Um, the merchants weren't exactly like the boss of the of these cottagers. You know, they, they paid them, they hired them, uh, but the cottagers ultimately decided how much and how quickly they worked. And merchant capitalists searched for more efficient methods of production became profound, resulting in the growth of factories in the Industrial Revolution. So as merchant capitalists became frustrated uh, 
with maybe the slow pace of the cottage industry, they began to experiment with new technology, in, especially in textile production. And this is what ultimately would give birth to the Industrial Revolution. So the Industrial Revolution has its origins in the cottage industry. So the results of the cottage industry is that thousands of poor rural families were able to supplement their income. Also, unregulated production in the countryside resulted in experimentation and the, the diversification of goods. Uh, this would in turn lead to the, eventually lead to the Industrial Revolution. And goods uh, included textiles, so all these types of cloth products, knives, forks, housewares, buttons, gloves, clocks, and musical instruments. The cottage industry flourished first in England. It's really most commonly associated with England, where the spinning and weaving of woolen cloth was most important. By 1500, as in 1500, half of England's textiles were produced in the countryside, and by 1700, that percentage was higher. The putting out system in England spread later to continental countries, such as France and Germany, uh, but it will never be quite as prolific as it was in England. Now, this also, like I said, would lead to some proto-industrial technology. Um, we'll talk about this stuff more in the context of the Industrial Revolution. We'll revisit some of these topics, but this, still get, this at least gives us an indication of where we're headed. So proto-industrial technology is an example of how merchant capitalists are experimenting with new methods to increase their productivity and ultimately make more money. So for example, in 1733, John Kay invented the flying shuttle, which enabled the weaver to throw the shuttle back and forth between threads with, with one hand. So this uh, uh, expedited, meaning it sped up the production of, cl of cloth. And then in 1764, James Hargreaves invented the spinning jenny, which mechanized sp the spinning wheel so that eight spools of thread could spin simultaneously. So now he's inventing a sort of early machine that could do the work of eight women. Um, and so that is, of course, going to revolutionize the speed of production and encourage more and more innovation, which eventually leads to the Industrial Revolution, like I said. And now, finally, we are at part three, which is fortunately the shortest part of the lecture. And it is all about various economic developments and mercantilism. So we're going to expand our scope here and look at a little bit more of the global economy and especially how this relates to some of the European colonies that were established back in Unit 1. Same objective, we are exploring the continuities and changes in commercial and economic developments from 1648 to 1815. Several key concepts to know for this section. The first one, European, the European dominated worldwide economic network contributed to the agricultural, industrial, and consumer revolutions in Europe. Number two, European states followed mercantilist policies by drawing resources from colonies in the New World and elsewhere. Number three, the transatlantic sla slave labor system expanded in the 17th and 18th centuries as demand for New World products increased. And number four, overseas products and influences contributed to the development of a consumer culture in Europe. But it doesn't stop there. Number five, the importation and transplantation of agricultural products from the Americas contributed to an increase in the food supply in Europe. Number five, foreign lands provide, maybe that was number six, sorry. Uh, foreign lands provided raw materials, finished goods, laborers, and markets for the commercial and industrial enterprises in Europe. And last but not least, the development of the market economy led to new financial practices and institutions. And the same themes, economic, technological, and social, but we're also going to add interactions into this one as we broaden our scope to look at how European economics are affecting the colonies in the New World. So our first topic is European maritime expansion in the 18th century. Ultimately, world trade became fundamental to the European economy. 
uh, especially the Atlantic seaboard states in Spain, France, the Netherlands, England. But even these major players, um, their, their trade affected um, all other European states. So even though we have like the major Atlantic states, um, their business will still affect all the other European states. So that's why it's fundamental to all of Europe. Now, sugar became the most important commodity produced in the Atlantic trade. Um, tobacco, cotton, and indigo were also important, but sugar was the most popular and most profitable, and it largely came from the New World. And the slave trade was enormous, and these two things were connected because sugar was a very labor-intensive crop, and so African slavery was utilized for the production of sugar. Now, Spain and Portugal actually were able to revitalize their empires and grow economically from renewed development, but they're not going to be the powerhouses that they were in the 15th and 16th centuries. But uh, you know, Britain, France, the Netherlands will continue to remain on top economically, but it's still nice to see Spain and Portugal making a bit of a comeback. Uh, like I said, the Netherlands, Great Britain, and France benefited the most, and by far, uh, England had the largest number of immigrants to the New World at this time. So England had the largest navy, the largest merchant marine, and it also had the most profitable colonies, um, but it also had the most migration to those colonies, and that's one of the key reasons why this lecture is being delivered to you in the common language, language of English here in the United States. Now, mercantilism was really the defining economic feature um, of the time period due to the colonies and the world trade. And we've already talked about mercantilism. So this slide really is just a general review of the characteristics of mercantilism. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. Remember that the main goal of mercantilism was economic self-sufficiency. This was the goal of many European states, especially France, one of the most recent examples that we have studied. And a country or empire sought to create a favorable balance of trade by exporting more than it imported. So again, your exports should be greater than your imports. And the way this was usually achieved was, through, by, was by tariffs, by issuing tariffs. Uh, these are basically a tax on imports, and that's a way of limiting imports. Mercantilism is also based on this idea of bullionism, where governments sought to build up large reserves of gold and silver and prevent the flow of these precious metals out of their country. Uh, the idea here is that the more gold and silver you have, the wealthier you are. It's also based on this idea that wealth is very finite and manifested as gold and silver. Colonies were also critical in the, in the concept of mercantilism because colonies uh, provided raw materials and markets for the mother country. Also, a key part of mercantilism is that states granted monopolies to large countries, uh, or to companies, excuse me. So, for example, this is how the British East India Company or the Dutch East India Company became so wealthy and powerful as they basically had a monopoly on trade for these countries. And states encouraged development of domestic industries so that a country would not have to buy a finished product from a rival country. Again, that idea of economic self-sufficiency. So we talked about this a bit with France already in the Louis XIV lecture. So let's look a little bit more at Britain's economic development because Britain emerges as the economic power, leading economic of power of Europe in the 18th century. Um, the Bank of England played a major role in this. It was an important source of capital for economic development. So the Bank of England provided uh, capital like loans and resources for these early merchant capitalists in their trading ventures or the development of their cottage industries. Also, the Act of Union in 1707 unified England and Scotland. And the reason for this is because Scotland wanted to benefit from trade within the English Empire. So you might remember that Scotland and England had a lot of political issues. There were definitely a lot of rebellions against the Stuart kings of England from Scotland. Uh, so it may have perplexed you a little bit to be like, well, why did Scotland then join with England? 
Well, it was really about money. It was about the economic benefit. That's one of the reasons Scotland hasn't um, hasn't separated from England yet either. In in recent years, there was actually a, a referendum on whether or not Scotland should should leave the United Kingdom, but that referendum failed, and it was largely because of economic reasons. Although we'll see if that changes with Brexit, but that's going to be another story for the future. Anyways, British mercantilism differed from France in that. Government economic regulations often served the private interest of individuals and groups as well as the public needs of the state. So Britain was much more supportive of uh, private enterprise and private trade, whereas authoritarian states like France wanted an economic system that primarily benefited the state rather than businessmen and workers. Uh, for example, in France, the Entendant system was extended throughout the French Empire um, as a means of, of the government controlling the economy. So there's more of a, a free market in England than there is in France, for example. And this is one of the many factors that contributes to England's economic success and France's economic failure. Now, England also had passed something called the Navigation Acts. Uh, this was, these were laws passed by Parliament to increase military power and private wealth in England. The first act was passed in 1651 uh, in order to reduce Dutch domination of the Atlantic trade. It was issued by Oliver Cromwell. This was one of the few positive contributions Cromwell had to English society. And it was then extended by Charles II in 1660 and 1663. So the reason the Navigation Acts are significant is because um, the Navigation Act required that most goods imported from Europe into Great Britain had to be carried on British-owned ships with British crews or on ships of the country producing the specific good, which basically meant that Britain was not going to buy stuff that was brought in by France or Spain. So it gave British merchants and ship owners a virtual monopoly on trade with the colonies. Uh, so to, in order to trade with the British colonies, so it's not like France basically could send a ship over, get a bunch of cotton and molasses and other things from the British colonies and try to sell that to Britain. Britain would not allow that with the Navigation Acts. So Colonists were able to ship their products, things like sugar, tobacco, and cotton, on British ships and buy almost all of their European goods from Britain, which has both positive and negative consequences. Great Britain was also highly involved in triangular trade, which was really the center of the Atlantic economy. It revolved around the West Indies and the Caribbean and included North America and Africa. Think of it as like a giant triangle in the Atlantic. And the classic model for triangular trade, especially with Britain, is that finished goods from Britain uh, to North, there were, their finished goods would be brought from Britain to the North American colonies where raw materials like fish and rice and oil and timber were then placed on ships and sent to Jamaica or Barbados, where those goods were traded for sugar and could be sent back to Britain for refining. So the triangular trade could also go from, you know, the British colonies in, in the north to the Caribbean colonies back to, um, back to Europe. But also the Atlantic slave trade played a role. New England colonies could also ship rum to Africa, where slaves would then be placed on ships and headed to the West Indies and traded for molasses, which was then shipped northward to the American colonies. But much of this trade was illegal under the navigation laws because traders, both English and American, made fortunes nonetheless. You know, the navigation laws could only be enforced to a certain extent, and in the faraway North American colonies, uh, people did what they had to do in order to make money, and that sometimes included trading with uh, countries that were not the British. But don't worry, we won't tell. So the slave trade continues to be a major factor in the world economy. In fact, there was dramatic growth in the Atlantic slave trade um, as, uh, the as agriculture and uh, sugar plantations in the, co in the colonies expanded. Uh, 
uh, 12.5 million Africans were transported to the New World in the 17th and 18th centuries. Half of the slave trade occurred aboard British ships, about 25% on French ships, and the rest on Dutch, Portuguese, Danish, and American ships. British and French governments gave chartered companies monopolies over the slave trade in the 17th and early 18th century, and therefore forts, also sometimes called factories, were set up on the West African coast to oversee and protect the slave trade. Although, despite their best efforts to keep a monopoly on the slave trade, uh, independent slave traders ultimately broke that monopoly by the 1730s. So while the British uh, dominated the slave trade, they're definitely going to be sort of rogue slave traders who are not attached to one country or another. Now, most slaves were actually captured by rival African tribes who traded said slaves for European goods such as cloth, alcohol, and weapons. So it's important to remember that Africans uh, captured other Africans and sold them into slavery. Uh, but many slaves that were captured in the African interior died on forced marches onto the West African coast. So most of the slaves that wind up in the Americas were from Western Africa. Uh, those that even made it onto the ships uh, also faced an enormous risk during the Middle Passage. Between one-fifth and one-third of all slaves died en route to the New World while they were on the slave ships crossing the Middle Passage. When they arrived in the New World, most slaves were taken to Brazil or the West Indies, usually to work sugar plantation. Um, as many as 400,000 ended up in British North America in colonies such as Virginia, Maryland, and South Carolina, the typical American South. And in those colonies, they were primarily used for the cultivation of cotton and tobacco. But like I said, the vast majority of slaves went to the Caribbean and Brazil, where they were used in uh, sugar production. So the slave trade dwindled significantly by the 1780s. Um, and this was due to uh, some advocacy for, uh, for um, abolition, so abolition movements. Also, France outlaws slavery as part of its revolution, and slavery starts to develop a, a negative stigma. Um, and so the slave trade dwindled. Um, it's not, it doesn't become illegal yet. But it will, we will start to see those abolition, abolition movements emerge in the late 18th and early 19th century. Um, but even though the slave trade dwindled, there is still population growth of slaves, natural population growth from slaves in the New World into the 19th century. And we're starting to wrap things up now with our last topic, looking a little bit more at colonial Latin America. In, from, in, from, in regards to the Spanish colonies, in the 18th century, Spain's colonies were made a very important part of the Atlantic economy, despite Spain's own economic decline. Silver mining ultimately recovered in Mexico and Peru as they discovered new sources of silver. Um, this meant that silver mining quadrupled in the 18th century. And New World silver accounted for about half of the world's supply of silver. And the Spanish Empire began to recover under the reign of Philip V. That was the Philip of Anjou, who was Louis XIV's grandson. So he actually proved to be a pretty successful king of Spain. It probably helps that he wasn't inbred into a state of retardation. But anyway, uh, he helped to make... Uh, to rebuild Spain's navy so that it became the third most powerful in the world behind Britain and France. Um, after the War of Spanish Succession, Spain improved its control over its empire for at least another hundred years, although its colonies will start to uh, establish their own independence during the Age of Revolutions in the early 19th century. And the enlightened despotism, so that's like the enlightened absolutism of Charles III, ultimately expanded economic and administrative reforms that would also improve uh, Spain proper and its empire. 
We'll talk more about that when we get to enlightened absolutism and specific examples in a future lecture. Um, these next topics we talked about a little bit already back in unit one, but it's, they're still relevant as we examine sort of the economic development of Spain's New World colonies. So you might remember the term Creoles. Creoles were Spaniards born in Latin America. Um, initially, they were not as powerful as the Peninsulares, who were Spaniards born in Spain. But by the time we get to the, eight, to the 17th and 18th century, Creoles were really the top of the social ladder. They came to rival the power of traditional Spanish authorities. And they wanted to recreate a European-style aristocracy in Latin America with, of course, the Creoles at the top. Some were wealthy merchants who benefited from smuggling activities. Uh, many of them were landowners. And American Indians were shifted from forced labor to debt peonage on owner's land. So the Creoles utilized American Indians um, to labor on their land. And the Creoles only accounted for about 20% of the American population, but they are going to own far more than 20% of the land. Now, the Mestizos were children born to Spanish fathers and Indian mothers, like I've mentioned earlier in Unit 1. Colonial Latin America was a very mixed-race society, and these Mestizos represented about 30% of the population. And the American Indian population could make up as much as 70%. Now, I realize these numbers don't perfectly add up to 100, but that's because you have to understand that there's different percentages in different locations. But on average, Creoles were about 20%, Mestizos could be up to 30%, and Native Americans could be up to 70%, again, sort of depending on the specific region. And landowners continue to believe that American Indians should do the hard labor in the countryside, although black slavery uh, remained the dominant form of labor on the sugar plantations of Cuba and Puerto Rico. Now, Brazil, you might remember, was dominated by the Portuguese. And Brazil had an enormous amount of sugar plantations, which required a massive number of slaves. Um, so that's why most of the slaves from Africa went directly to Brazil. By the early 19th century, half of Brazil's population was of African descent. And you can still see that, uh, that mixed ethnicity and that heritage in Brazil's population today. So the Portuguese, the Indians, meaning the Native Americans, and the African populations in Brazil intermixed socially to a greater degree than in the Spanish Empire. And so as a result, uh, Brazil had an even more multicolor and multicultural population, whereas in the Spanish territories, there wasn't quite as much of the um, interbreeding. They tended to be a little bit more segregated. And then, of course, North America was, was very, very segregated between blacks and whites. All right, hope you enjoyed this long lecture about economic history. I know we covered many fascinating topics. Uh, we will go over in class the most important things that you'll need to remember. But for now, thank you for listening and enjoy the rest of your day.